Is that better? Yes. Okay, I said thank you for inviting me to your church. Did you enjoy that hymn? Yes. It's one of my favorite hymns. How can it be that, oh my God, thou died for, that thou, my God, didst die for me? So I'm not here really because of any merit of our own. We're here only because of his merit. But what strikes me about that song, as you know, Wesley wrote it, good old Protestant song, is that no Roman Catholic can sing it. You can't sing it. Yeah, theology is wrong. Because according to Roman Catholicism, Jesus never died for you. He never died for you. And you are not saved by his blood, according to them, but by his works. And also by the works of every saint that according to them have walked this earth. And all of these good works go into a chest. This is not my lecture, I don't know. You chose the song, it's not my fault. <laughs> goes into this chest, which is called the tr treasury of merit. You know that theology, don't you? Who does not understand that theology? You all understand it, and why am I preaching it then? <laughs> Here's one who doesn't, who doesn't understand it, so that's good. Uh, by the way, do you know how Wesley came into the church, right? He attended a meeting and there was an evangelist. And he was supposed to preach and there was only one attendee. And that was Wesley. And the preacher said, well, I'm really going to waste my time. Maybe we should just cancel. But then he thought, you know, there's one. I'll preach. And the rest is history, isn't it? Yeah, so don't underestimate God. Anyway, he takes out of that treasury of merit, and then with that merit, he can relieve your time in purgatory. Because Catholicism teaches that Jesus never died for you. Therefore, you must bear the consequences of your sins yourself. And all forgiven sins must be paid for in full. That's why you have to have a place called purgatory. And in purgatory, you pay for those sins and they burn away over time until you've paid the penalty and then you can pass through into the pearly gates. Of course, if you never confessed your sins to a priest, you go to the hotter place. But that's the theology. God never died for you. And that is why when they signed that joint declaration, this is not part of my lecture, okay? Just, <laughs> you chose the hymn, it's your fault. Whoever chose the hymn. When they signed that joint declaration on justification, together we confess that by grace alone, through Christ's saving works, we are justified. You should not say amen, brother. <laughs> you should weep between the porch on the altar and put some ashes on your head and sit in sackcloth. Because that's what the Protestants signed. And it's a lie. It's a Jesuit lie, perfectly written so that every Protestant will fall into the trap. And that is the problem. Because it's not by grace alone. There is grace, of course, alone. That is true. But it is by faith alone. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. By faith alone. And not through his saving works, but through his blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So it's cleverly written to mask Catholic theology in Protestant terminology. And the Protestants say, where do I sign? 
and they cannot wait to reconcile. You cannot reconcile a system which says Christ through his precious blood atoned for my sins. Oh my God who died for me. You cannot reconcile that with the theology of he never died for you, you have to pay for your sins yourself. And therefore we will invent purgatory and burn them off you until you have paid for them yourself. You don't need Christ. It's a sad theology. Now I was a Catholic. And that's why I love that hymn. I sing it with all the power that I have. And in heaven, I'll only get a little triangle because I'm useless at it. <laughs> but I try. And that's not what I came here to talk about. <laughs> but it's important to know, isn't it? Yeah. It's very important to know because the whole Christian world is being duped into believing that a system that denies the death of Jesus Christ and his atonement is masquerading as a system that embraces it? That is a travesty of justice which goes against the grain where every Protestant should stand up and do what? Protest! Yes. Thank you, thank you. We should protest. Now I did a series called uh, Conflict and Triumph recently. Some of you might have listened a little bit while we did it at the camp meeting. And I thought this was a very important thing that I had to do. I felt driven to do it. Because people always say, why do you Seventh-day Adventists think that you've eaten the knowledge with a big silver spoon? Who do you think you are? And you're so arrogant. Why do you think that you are the bee's knees and everybody else is Babylon? I mean, it's a big mouthful to make people swallow, isn't it? Yes, and it does sound incredibly arrogant. But what if it's true? <laughs> I was in Germany once and I did this lecture. And uh, I was telling them about Jesus being the only way. And this lady got up. I know you might have heard the story. And she screamed at me from the audience. You haven't done that yet. I must try harder. <laughs> and she said, that is so arrogant. How can you say that Jesus is the only one? What about Islam? What about Buddhism? What about Hinduism? You think you're the only way? Do you think this is the only way? And I said to her, you're, you're absolutely right. It's incredibly arrogant. Unless it's true. Then it's not arrogant, then it's just a fact. So I gave her a little analogy. I said, statistically speaking, there are seven billion people in the world, of which about three and a half billion are men. So statistically speaking, the probability that I'm the father of my children is one in three and a half billion. <laughs> but irrespective of that, I'm the father, so that's just a fact. Take it or leave it. If he says he's the only way, and he is the only way, then there is no other way. And if he is God, because that's what we sang, right? You see what you do when you, when you choose a hymn like that? <laughs> if he is God and he has life within himself and he lays it up and he takes it up again, then not everybody can claim to have life within himself to lay it down and take it up again. You have to be God and able to be able to do that. Wouldn't you agree? Then, then that's just a fact. And I haven't been convinced that Buddha was a god, nor that Muhammad was a god, or any other one of them was a god, or Krishna, or any one of them. I don't think that uh, we're on a wrong road here. Anyway, pearls of truth in settings of gold, what is that about? There's a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the schools of the prophets and the records of his dealings with the nations 
were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So today, we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of earth. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements and to understand the progress of events in marshalling the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. That's our job, to study history, to see what is happening amongst the nations, how are they being marshaled for the final conflict? That is our job description. We have to do it. And uh, it's not a very popular job description. Now, Seventh-day Adventism arose in the North American continent, especially there in the area around New York. That is where we find the cradle of Seventh-day Adventism. And this lecture is about that, and I'm not going to give this lecture. I just wanted to show you that uh, slide. <laughs> uh, I only have two days, so what shall I do here? Okay. So how did it arise, and why did it arise in North America? You know, if, you, if you're preaching in Europe, they're not interested in some sect that arose in North America. If you're preaching in Southern Africa, which is a Protestant district, they're not interested. Why should it come from America? Who does America think they are, after all, right? Why should it come out of America? And that history is so fascinating. What happened in the Reformation was that they discovered the five pillars of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola Christos, Christ and Christ alone. Sola Gratia, Sole Fides, faith and faith alone. Those, those are the principles of Protestantism. And then they ensconced themselves in a state and church conglomerate and warred against each other for years, the 30-year war, and killed millions and millions of people. And slowly the cantons were divided into Protestant cantons and Catholic cantons. And if you were in a Protestant canton and the prince or the elector was a Protestant, then the entire population in his canton had to be what? Protestant. Protestant. And if you were in a Catholic canton, what happened then? Catholic. You had to be Catholic. And if you didn't want to be a Catholic because of some conviction that you had, you had to move. Or else you died. And vice versa. So your religion was determined by the state. And very early on, again, this is not this lecture, this is another lecture. <laughs> very early on, even in the time of Martin Luther, there was a man who was called Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt. Could you say that, please? <laughs> Excellent. Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt. He was the dean of Wittenberg University. He's the one who capped Martin Luther. He was born in the exact same year, but he was his senior. And when Martin Luther was whisked off to the Wartburg, because he was being persecuted, and there he gave us this great gift, the translation of the Bible into the common tongue, which inspired others to put the Bible into the common tongue. While he was there, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt. It's a nice name, eh? Actually, Karlstadt is not his name. Karlstadt is the town that he came from. His name was Andreas Bodenstein, and he came from von Karlstadt, the town. Later on, they dropped the Andreas Bodenstein because it became too complicated, and they just called him Karlstadt. He called someone after a town. I mean, that's crazy. But nevertheless, 
he suddenly discovered things. He discovered things and he started writing it. Wait a minute, doesn't the Bible teach adult baptism? Wait a minute, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible teach about the Sabbath? And Martin Luther wrote and said, if we follow Karlstadt, then we'll have to keep the Sabbath on the seventh day like the Jews do. And Karlstadt discovered, hang on a second, here's a problem with all these images, because if you were in a Catholic canton, you, the cathedrals belonged to the Catholics. If you taken over and you were in a Protestant canton, the cathedrals belonged to the Protestants, but they were still Catholic cathedrals. And so Karlstadt said, excuse me, let's remove all of these images and statues. And they had a thing called Bildersturm. Bild is, a, is, a, is an image. And they stormed them and took them down. And then everybody got very upset about this. And out of these movements eventually came a group called the Anabaptists. And they took this idea of adult baptism further. Anabaptist means to be baptized again. And what happened to them? They said, excuse me, you want to be baptized again? We'll baptize you again. They drowned them. Thousands of them. Thousands. Tens of thousands. Why? Because they discovered adult baptism. Now this was a problem because if you accept adult baptism, well, then you make your decision as to whom you want to follow based on your conviction from the word of God rather than the conviction of the political leadership in your canton. If you were baptized as an infant, well then you were welcomed into the system and became part of the system. If you were baptized as an adult, that was an, a danger to the state. Because now you were basing your decision not on the status quo protected by government, but upon your conviction. And so they hounded them and slaughtered them. And the Protestants tried their utmost to keep up with the Catholics in slaughtering them. So eventually, some of these Anabaptists, they had a bad name because they also had some other weird people, but they weren't all weird. Some of them were weird and were rolling around and hooping and doing things like that, like modern churches in your country do today. <laughs> and they don't seem to have a bad name, I don't know why, but in those days it was considered strange. And then you had, out of them came the Mennonites and the Amish and all of those, and they couldn't find a place anywhere without being slaughtered or hounded. And even if they did find solace somewhere in uh, the Netherlands, where they said, okay, you can stay, they said to them, we'll give you the worst farmland on the, in the world and you can farm there. And then they, they improved the land and it started to bear fruit. And the people said, whoo, this is nice. And they took it away and gave them bad farmland again. So eventually they all escaped and they ran to where? To North America. And you had all of these little groups. And then later on developed other groups like uh, in England, the Church of England, you know, had the same church and state. This is not the lecture, this is, I'm still coming to it, but. And then you had people who say, no, hang on a second. We have to make a decision here based on our conviction and not based on what the state dictates. And they were called Congregationalists because the congregation decides who they will worship and how they will worship. And so they were hounded and they ran away and where did they come to? They came to this place, North America. And then there was a man by the name of Hans Hut. Have you ever heard of Hans Hut? Actually, it's not Hans Hut. I think it's Hans Hut. 
because he was German. These Germans are a pain in the neck, I'll tell you. <laughs> Hans Hut. Hut means hat. And Hans Hut said, we have, to add, we have to have adult baptism. But there's one thing that we missed. All these people that have church and state, they're following Augustine, who believed in the city of God and that the world would be ruled by the church through the state. That's wrong. Christ will come before the millennium and he will destroy the wicked. This was in the time of Martin Luther. So what did they do to Hans Hut? They tortured him almost to death. In what town? Wittenberg. Can you believe that? Protestants tortured that man almost to death. And that night his candle fell over as he lay in that dungeon and his bedding caught the light and he asphyxiated, he died. They were horrified. The man died without them. So they did the same to him as they did to Wycliffe. They went and burnt his bones. Who did that? Catholics or Protestants? Protestants. Protestants. So these ideas eventually spread amongst various groups and they all escaped later when they could and they came to where? To this place. And then you had the great British poets, Milton, and you had Tyndall, who wrote the Bible in English, and he believed in soul sleep, just like Martin Luther believed in soul sleep. And eventually, they were put in jail. And there they sat for years and years and years. Why? Because they said their own prayer. You can't say your own prayer. You have to pray out of the, the church prayer book, which had the prayers of Latimer and Ridley and Cranmer. Wonderful Protestants. I believe they will all be in heaven. But you can't say any other prayer. You go to jail for 12 years. Even if you write Pilgrim's Progress, you go to jail. And where did these people escape to? They came to North America. And then the Baptists arose. And slowly, slowly, these things started to be accepted. But not really. The greatest preacher in the Baptist world that ever lived is no doubt Charles Spurgeon. Would you agree? He wrote more than, I don't know how many volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica, although he actually never wrote anything. It's all his sermons put together. But it's amazing. Brilliant preacher. But he was a Calvinist. He was a Calvinist. His doctrine was Calvinistic. And Calvinists believe in predestination, right? But the Baptists eventually spread and many of them escaped the absolute turmoil and blood in Europe. And where did they escape to? North America. And very soon they became the largest denomination in North America. And they split on many levels. And one split was called Seventh-day Baptists. Have you heard of them? And there was a lady amongst them. Her name was Rachel Oakes. Have you heard of her? And Rachel introduced the Sabbath to the Millerites. See how it works? And then, because Spurgeon was a Calvinist and he believed in, uh, well, Calvinism, predestination, God, by a fiat decree, determines who will be saved and who will be lost. And before, because God makes the choice for you, you have no say in the matter and you fall under irresistible grace if you have been chosen for salvation and you will be saved like it or not 
And if you are chosen for damnation, you have nothing to complain about because that's your just deserve. You will go to hell for all eternity. And because of the distance between salvation and damnation, through the pain of the damnation, the glory of the glorification is so much greater. And even early on, there was this debate in Calvinism. And there was a group of people called the Remonstrants in the Netherlands. And they remonstrated against this theology and said, this cannot be true. This makes God the author of sin. And eventually, what happened to these people that were remonstrants? They were persecuted, yes. So they escaped. Where did they escape to? To North America. But it took another champion. And his name was Wesley. See what you do when you start with a hymn? It's all your fault that I haven't come to my lecture yet. And Wesley said, no. If God, by a fiat decree, chooses only some to be saved, predestines them, and predestines others to be lost, then he's worse than the devil. Then he's worse than the devil. And he championed this Armenian idea, Armenianism, that uh, God is a God of justice. God is a God of, of grace as well. Amen. And this combination. And you know what Wesley also discovered? You can't just do with your body what you want to. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So who started the temperance movements in the world? Who started the idea that you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't use alcohol, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who was it? It was the Methodists. And when the Methodists preached in England, the public used to drive their cattle through their meetings to disrupt them. And so the Methodists ran and they escaped and they went where? They went to North America. So the amazing thing about North America, I'm from Africa, I don't know why I'm preaching this. The amazing thing is that all of these ideas, post-Reformation ideas, were seated in North America. And every single one of those ideas was bathed in the blood of the martyrs. For every single one of those ideas, thousands upon thousands upon thousands paid for their, with their lives. And then came the Great Awakening. And the Baptists had to decide where do they stand in terms of the character of God. Are they standing with Calvinism? Or are they going to move towards the Armenian idea? And a man called Finney, he started preaching in the Great Awakening in this continent. But he had the Augustinian idea of the millennium. He got the Calvinism part right by breaking from it. And the Wesleyans, they had it, I believe, right. And then another man arose, and his name was Miller. You know him? William Miller? And then the Millerite movement began, and the great Advent awakening began, and guess what? Every single one of those doctrines that people had died for, that people had suffered for, were being collected into one denomination. Every single one of them into one denomination. The state of the dead. Is that an Adventist invention? No. It's a biblical invention. 
and people died for it. And they sat in jails and rotted for it. Those ideas came in. And Hans Hut, he didn't die for nothing, he planted a seed. And those ideas came in. Miller discovered the same thoughts. And the seeds had already been planted amongst many of the people. They'd all become again ensconced in their little religions. And the shaking that took place took one out here and one out there. I believe out of all of those denominations, we're going to see thousands come into this denomination. Not because we're arrogant and because we think we have eaten the truth by the spoonful, but because people died for that truth and gave it to us as a gift. And then how do you make a sense out of all of this when there are so many other confusing ideas? And so God in his wisdom for the remnant church, according to scripture, said, I'll help you. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And we are so ashamed of it. It is such a burden for the church. If only it would go away. Oh. Now I became an Adventist not knowing anything about spirit of prophecy or Ellen G. White. I was baptized not knowing that name. Why? Well, I was a big wheel. I came from the university. I had a PhD in lies. So I was very important. And they felt, you know, uncomfortable telling me all of these things. So they told me what I found fascinating and they left the rest out. And then one day when I was on my farm and we were quite destitute, this colleague of mine phoned me and he said, why did you become a Seventh-day Adventist? So I tried to explain to him. Ever tried to explain that to someone? <laughs> Especially an ex-colleague at the university. Have you ever tried that? Well, he got very irate. And then eventually he screamed at me and he said, and you have that kleptomaniac, explicit, explicit, explicit woman, Ellen G. White. And he said it with such vehemence that it piqued my interest. <laughs> and when I put the phone down, I said to my wife, who's Ellen G. White? <laughs> it's true, this happened. And uh, we had a coal porter who used to come past our farm on his route. A small little man, very cute little man, I thought he was totally weird, but anyway, he always brought us books. And so we looked at this box of books that he took out, that he brought, and I reached in and I took one. And my wife reached in and she took another one, bless her soul. It was called Councils on Diets and Foods. I don't know whether I should thank her for that or condemn her forever. Maybe there is a purgatory after all. <laughs> and she read that. That's the first book she ever read. But me, I was a little bit uh, wiser. I took another one, which was called Desire of Ages. And once you start reading that, you're a changed person, don't you agree? Once you start reading the other one, you're also a changed person. <laughs> It's just a bit more painful. <laughs> anyway, 
so when, when everybody came to an impasse, that's when the spirit of prophecy kicked in and the path was clearly set out. Not some new strange path, by the way. Not some new strange path. Just a confirmation of that which was already there in certain quarters. And that is how this church came together. And then there was a great disappointment. And then one final cherry was placed on top of the cake. And it was called the sanctuary message. Amen. That little cherry. And it happened in a wheat field. As a man was walking through the wheat field. There's a beautiful analogy there. The harvest is right. But there's something that all those churches had missed. How much of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, concerned the sanctuary? Just about all of it, right? To the law, the Torah. And the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. So wouldn't it be logical that the great sanctuary message should be discovered by the last church again, having been taught by the first one, lost through all of those ages, and then picked up again here towards the end? Yes or no? And people said, are you crazy? Who do you think you are with this investigative judgment nonsense? That makes you a sect. Did you know that? Yep. But doesn't the Bible say that when he comes, his reward is with him? And the angel will come and separate the wicked from the just? Doesn't it say that? Well, excuse me, if he knows who was wicked and who was just, wasn't there a judgment before he came? So what's wrong with the pre-advent judgment? If you don't believe in it, you don't believe the Bible. So we're not fancy. We're just the product of eons of suffering. And God is attacking, not God, sorry, the enemy of God is attacking this remnant. And the attack is going to get worse. Now I get to tonight's lecture. Is my time up? <laughs> now I've given this before, but I'll give it again. I'll try to be brief. I'm going to do it by means of this analogy, and some of you might have seen it, but it doesn't matter, you can watch it again. Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. That was God's plan, that his church should be ruled by judges. Not by a king. But the people said, we want a king. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. I remember all that blood that flowed, and the congregationalists, and all those people that said, no, no, we make a decision when we are convinced of the facts that we want to follow Jesus Christ, we will be baptized into all truth. No, they wanted a king. Jesus said to them that the Gentiles exercise dominion over their people and they exercise authority, but it shall not be so amongst you. We don't have that system. If you want to be great, then you have to be the least. If you want to be a minister, then minister. And if you want to be the chief, then become a servant. So the organization of the churches at Jerusalem was to serve as a model for the organization of churches in every other place where messengers of truth would win converts to the gospel. And those to whom was given the responsibility of the general oversight of the church were not to lord it over God's heritage. But as wise shepherds were to feed the flock of God, being examples to the flock. These men were to take positions unitedly on the side of right, 
and to maintain it with firmness and decision. Thus they would have a uniting influence upon the entire flock. I have a friend, he's smaller than me. You know him, his name is Francois. He taught me a very important thing, let no man tell you your duty. That's very important. Let no man tell you your duty. We have to make our decisions based on truth. So later this church was somewhat modified, various parts of the world, the groups came together, and then God endowed the church with special gifts. Now I want to talk about the story of Deborah. Because Deborah, I believe, the story is a type of what is happening in our time. I believe this story, which has an eschatological flavor where God intercedes on behalf of the nation and fights from heaven with his holy angels, is a type of what we are about to experience and are experiencing. Judges 4. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud, the previous judge, was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Hashoret of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, she judged Israel at that time. Now, I believe these names are very, very important and that they tell a story. So you have this arrogant king, and his name is Jabin. And he reigns in a city called Hazor. And he has a general whose name is Sisera. And you have a prophetess whose name is Deborah. And she has a husband whose name is Lapidot. Now there was such a place because here are the archaeological finds of Hazor. And here are the ruins of Hazor where these Canaanite kings ruled. Now let's have a look at some of the meanings of these names. Jabin the king. It means one who is intelligent or discerning. So he's a very bright man, a very intelligent, discerning man. Is he on God's side or is he against God? He's against God. And then he has a general, and his name is Sisera, and that means horse or swift. So can I make the analogy that the enemies of God and his people are worldly wise men and they have the military power to back it up. They have chariots of iron. Now iron we also find in Daniel in chapter 2 and it represents which kingdom? Rome. And these chariots were equipped with scythe-like blades and they would race through the opposing armies and just thresh them like wheat cut them to pieces. So the Israelites were afraid of this military power. So his, his weapons were his chariots and his horses. And do you remember that God said that Israel should not multiply its horses? Why not? Because they were to rely on God and not to rely on their horses. So here you have this worldly wise king and he has a general called Sisera who has a military uh, power at his disposal and therefore his name means horse and swift. Now Deborah means a bee, a pollinator, one who pollinates. And she's married to Lapidot which means lamp and enlightened. And then there is another man who becomes the general of God's army, of the Israelites. And he is Barak. 
And his name means thunder and lightning. Now what are the weapons of God? Horses or thunder and lightning? Thunder and lightning, right? And uh, if you read the stories of the Old Testament, you'll see how often God interceded with thunder and lightning. So you have a worldly wise king, a general with all the military power at his disposal. Opposed to him, you have a frightened little general called Barak, who only has at his disposal thunder and lightning. So he doesn't have chariots. But he has Deborah, the prophetess. And she's married to the source of light and enlightenment. Get the story? And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah, that's a previous Deborah, between Ramah and Betal in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now judgment in this sense means more than just deciding what's right and what's wrong, but for information. And she, please note this, she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, there's another name, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw towards Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulun, 10,000 men against that mighty army of Sisera with his chariots of iron and you have your, at your disposal thunder and lightning. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude and I will deliver him into thine hand. Here's a promise. Now, Abinoam means father of pleasantness. And where did he live, Barak? He lived in Kadesh. And Kadesh was a city of refuge. What happened in a city of refuge? If you were a murderer or an extreme criminal, where did you run to? To a city of refuge. Because really, you were under a death decree but the death decree was stayed in the city of refuge, as long as you stayed there. My dear brothers and sisters, we are all murderers and criminals. And we are sitting in a city of refuge. You pop your head out of this city of refuge, you're going to get it chopped off. And there are many people that are saying, run from the city of refuge. I'm hearing them everywhere. If you don't believe their way, you're Babylon. Don't believe them. So they were from a city of refuge. Now this Kishon River is very interesting because that's where Elijah later killed all the Baal priests. And you'll find it in 1 Kings chapter 18. And Elijah said, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. So Sisera and his army was to be destroyed where? At the Kishon. That's where Baal worship was later also destroyed. And Barak said unto her, unto Deborah, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee. Notwithstanding, the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. These are very important words in the Bible. If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she says, I will surely go with thee. So let's have a look at those words. 
If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. I think those words are full of meaning. So let's draw a parallel to our church, this city of refuge. Then Deborah would be the equivalent today of someone called Ellen Gould White. And Barak would equate with those that stand in the forefront and have to fight the battles of the Lord against a worldly wise king with a mighty general at his disposal. The word Ellen means light and mercy. The word gold means gold. And if you go to the book of Revelation, Laodicea, I counsel of you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that stands for character that you must develop. And white stands for righteousness. The third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. Now, can we afford to fight the battles of the Lord without the antitypical Deborah accompanying us? No, I don't think so. And the honor that we get will not come our way if we fight this battle. Who gets the honor? A woman. Now a woman stands for what? For a church. So let's introduce the next episode in this interesting saga. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali two small portions of Israel. Small portions. Not all tribes, two small portions. This is important. How many tribes were there? Twelve. Two small portions. And he marches with his 10,000 measly men to Kadesh. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Ah, those beautiful words. And now we're introduced to another element here. Heber the Kenite which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. Now some people will say the Bible is, is contradictory because the father-in-law of Moses was who? Correct. Then why don't they call him by that name? Why do they call him Hobab? Well, you see, the one is a title and the other one is a given name. The one means a priest, a high priest, and the other one is his given name. There's no contradiction here. And this man was a Kenite. So he was related very strongly to Moses and he had same interests. And look what this man did. He wasn't an Israelite. He was a Kenite. But he separated himself. He had severed himself from the Kenites. This is fascinating. And pitched his tent unto the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh. So here was a man who came out of one of the sister churches, if I may say so, and separated himself to God's people. And he's married to a lady called Jael. So Jael, the wife of Heba. Now Jael means ibex, a sure-footed mountain goat. And she's married to Heba, and Heba means an alliance. And she's the one that eventually recognizes Sisera after God destroys Sisera's army and destroys that army down at the river. But Sisera runs away and he finds a place in Jael's house. Now the story gets interesting. In Judges 5 verse 24, you have the song of Deborah. And she sings, Blessed above women shall Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. Now, Heba means an alliance. It's 
It's like a covenant. He'd signed a covenant. Did you sign a covenant with God? That you will keep all his commandments? Did you separate yourself from wherever you came from unto the people of the Lord? Yes or no? Did you have to pay a price for that? Yes. So Jael represents the end time church. And she's the one that gets the credit. Not the evangelist. Nobody gets baptized into Walter Fight or Doug Batchelor or whosoever out there. Nor is anyone baptized into amazing discoveries or amazing facts or it is written or whatever they call themselves. They get baptized into what? The Seventh Day Adventist Church. So who gets the credit? The church. Did I invent the doctrines? Am I so smart that I invented the doct doctrines? No. I never invented the doctrines. Remember, I have a degree in error and lies. <laughs> and when I discovered the truth, I quoted that Bible verse. Surely I have inherited lies. Everything I believed was wrong. I was an evolutionist, you know that, right? I was an atheist, I was an occultist, I was, you name it. Truth, I had no idea. I found it here. And not because you had discovered it, but because somebody before you had discovered it and paid a heavy price for it. And don't think the price will go away because the price is coming again. We're heading towards it. Blessed above women shall jail the wife of Heber the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. What does the tent stand for? The church. The tent of meeting, remember? The church. So who is she? If we go to Psalms 45 verse 8, talking about Jesus. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and acacia. Out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters, is that singular or plural? Plural. Were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. There were many women. Who are these women? All the great women of the Reformation that paid that heavy price. All those people that died for their faith under Lutheranism. All those that suffered under Methodism. All those that suffered under Mennonitism. All those that suffered under the Amish. All those that suffered under the Baptists. These are the honorable women out of all those churches. But one of them had gathered them all, those truths. And she was the queen in gold of Ophir, the full character and beauty of Jesus Christ, revealed in this hospital called Seventh Day Adventism. Amen. Deborah's song, and the kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven, the stars in their course, courses, and they fought against Sisera. So who conquered Sisera? God, with his holy angels. He made the wheels come off. He discomforted them. He destroyed them. And Sisera ran. The river Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon, that false religion had to go. O oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horse hooves broken by means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. That army, no matter how powerful that military army is, is not going to stand. And then these terrible words. Curse ye, Meros, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to help of the Lord against the mighty. Who was Meros? The Bible doesn't say who Meros was. 
But Meros knew what was right, and they should have come to the help of the Lord. So Meros is a subgroup of Israelites that lived in the area where the war took place. When Barak came with his 10,000 men, these men decided, we're not getting involved. Cursed be ye, Meros. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because you did not come to the help of the Lord. Woe to us if we don't get involved in this battle. It's called the great controversy. And whether you like it or not, you're part of it. And the princes of Issachar, they were with Deborah. Even Issachar and Barak. So God is praising a certain faction of the Israelites that were with whom? With Deborah. And he went and he sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Who's Reuben? That's a tribe of the Israelites, right? What did they do in this battle? They had great thoughts of heart. Why abodest thou amongst the sheepfolds? To hear the bleatings of the flock. For the divisions of Reuben there was great searchings of heart. What does that mean? It means that a whole tribe of God's people thought, uh, should, we, should we not get involved? Should we, should we not get involved? Ah, but the bleating of the sheep is so important. The sheep have to be maintained. This hovering over the sheep have to take care of the little congregation. Bleat, 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 bleat. <laughs> and they didn't get involved. Do you think it's going to be the same? Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And Dan, they remained in the ships. The economy is going to get tough, you know. We have to take care of ourselves. We have fields to worry about. Uh, you shouldn't rock the boat. Don't get involved with a war with uh, Jabin's general. But Zebulun and Naphtali, they were people that jeopardized their lives unto death in the high places of the field. But blessed above women shall jail the wife of Heba the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. Now it should get pretty clear. If she was the wife, wasn't she the only woman in the tent? No, there were other women in the tent. So obviously there's a deeper meaning. Who are the other women? All of those churches that I mentioned that had contributed to the truth. But here was Jael. He asked for water. She gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. She didn't have a sword. She had a hammer. She was working. Faith without works is dead. And with a hammer she smote Sisera. She smote off his head. This is a wicked woman. Look at what she's doing. And when she had pierced and stricken through his temples, at his feet he bowed, he fell. He lay down at her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. This is amazing. Now, Sisera runs away, and where does he think he can find solace? In the tent where Jael lives. This man is so arrogant, he thinks he's safe within the seventh day. Uh, sorry. <laughs> he thinks he's safe in her tent. He asked for water, but he actually got milk. What is milk? The word. The word. Cicero knew what this church stood for. He had an idea, and he thought he was safe in her midst. 
After all, some of his representatives had given lectures at the university and gotten standing ovations while they were doing it. So surely he should be safe in the, in the tent of jail. But she rose to the occasion. And this is prophetic. She took a tent pen and she rammed it through his forehead. Right through. That wasn't enough. She chopped off his head, it says there. She smote off his head until he was how dead? Dead. <laughs> feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down at her feet. He bowed, he fell, where he bowed, there he fell, down, dead. What sits here in the frontal lobe? Your mind, where you make decisions. What did Jael realize? That this general with his false philosophy and his false teachings that is going to destroy God's people and he thinks he has the power and the military might to back himself up and he has an arrogant king who thinks he's the most intelligent being on the planet that mindset had to go so she smashed it through with a tent peg and she killed it dead I want to tell you that the mindset of Sisera has to go in our midst. Amen. It has to go. Now let's introduce the other woman, the mother of Sisera. Uh, she's a mother. She looked out the window and cried through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariot? Her wise ladies answered her. So here were another bunch of ladies that were with the mother of Sisera. Is there a church today that calls herself the mother of all the churches? And does she have a whole lot of ladies that have signed the ecumenical documents of the world and sit in her councils, yes or no? And do even some of us think that it's a good idea to sign documents like that? <laughs> Fortunately, we don't have a system where one man rules or even groups of people rule. We have a bottom-up system. And uh, it doesn't matter if some people do strange things in our midst. It makes them apostate, not the church. Amen. Her wise ladies answered her. So these are the ladies in the ecumenical council. Yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two to Sisera a prey of diverse colors? A prey of diverse colors of needlework? You know what? We, we cannot deal with the diverse colors of needlework. What we need is the pure white robe of righteousness. We cannot have a patchwork character. And I'm afraid the ecumenical com movement consists of a patchwork character. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, mixed together with a lot of lies and a lot of false doctrine. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when it goes forth in his might and the land had rest forty years. So it is evident that not all the Israelites shared the same commitment to the call of Deborah as did Barak. Is that correct? And the church militant faces exactly the same position. I want to put it to you that the unifying factor is going to be the antitypical Deborah. We cannot afford to go into the final great conflict between good and evil without the antitypical Deborah testimonies showing us what the battle is about and where we stand in the great day that we are facing. It's going to be the deciding factor. Either you are for it 
or you are against it. Daniel 11.45, I believe this is the correct translation of that verse. And he, the Antichrist, will plant his tabernacle of his palaces between the seas, the nations, and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. So he'll plant his seeds, what's it say there? In the glorious holy mountain. I think he is so arrogant that he thinks he has the house of jail under control. I think he thinks he'll be quite comfortable in our midst. After all, aren't we in many places preaching his doctrines? A little bit of spiritual formation, salt here, a little bit of, you know what I mean, I don't have to go through all the details. He's going to come to his end. He's going to come to his end. So during the ages, this is from Acts of the Apostles, of spiritual darkness, the church of God has been as a city set on a hill. From age to age, through successive generations, the pure doctrines of heaven have been unfolding within its borders. That's how we started off. This is how it came together. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear, the church is the one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. It is the theater of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. Don't knock this church. We might have a Babylonian or two in our midst. We might have the representatives of Sisera and maybe Sisera himself one day speaking to us. I don't know. Don't worry about Sisera. There's a tent pen waiting for him. <laughs> now please, I'm not asking for anyone to knock a physical tent peg, peg through his brains. But I'm definitely asking that we remove that mindset from our midst and distinguish between what is from God and what is from the world. And if we've lost sight of that compass, then go back to the spirit of prophecy and get yourselves established again. Amen. Some have advanced the idea or the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. I've been instructed by the Lord that in this work there's no such thing as every man being independent. It doesn't happen. The Redeemer of the world does not sanction experience and exercise in religious matters independent of his organized and acknowledged church. If you think of all that blood that was spilt and eventually all those truths gathered into one movement which then became a universal movement. Just think of that miracle. Is God going to pass it by? No, he's going to cleanse his church. He's going to cleanse it. Many have an idea that they are responsible to Christ alone for their light and experience, independent of his recognized followers on this earth. But in the history of the conversion of Saul, important principles are brought to light. God sent Saul to the church. I didn't discover these churches and these truths because I was cleverer than anyone else. I was dumber than anyone else. I believed every lie that Satan had to offer. But I found truth here. Did I also find error? Yes. yes. Did God leave us on the path of error and not give us a way out? No. Revelation 22, 17 makes it quite clear that Christ and his church act in unison. It's the spirit and the bride that says, come. God uses his church, enfeebled and defective as it may be. Oh, how Satan would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get amongst this people and disorganize the work at a time when thorough organization is essential and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings 
and to refute claims not endorsed by the word of, word of God. We have so many movements at the moment. The anti-Trinitarian movement, the feast movement. You name the movements. Come out, this is Babylon. They ran, but they were not sent. In his article, Beheading Christ, Keith Jury writes, I have decided to submit to Christ's taste in bride picking. If he wants the church as his bride, I will accept her too. Jesus Christ, the head of the body, is easy to love. The body of Christ is harder to love. But I've chosen to love her for one single reason. Christ loves her and considers her beautiful. Perhaps he sees possibilities in her. I don't see. Perhaps that's how he sees me too. Next month I'm going to Germany. I must be insane to go back to Germany. <laughs> Why would I go back to Germany to be beaten up again? I'm going back to Germany. I don't care. I'm going back. Because his bride is also there. She's having a hard time, but she's there. As the end draws near, now listen to this one, and the work of giving the last warning to the world extends, it becomes more important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of the testimonies. We want to hide them under a bushel. We don't have to hide them under a bushel. Because if they are truth, then they must be able to stand the test, right? So take a, pick up the book and read it. If you find that it is not truth, and it's not in harmony with the Bible, then throw it away. Because Adventists have nothing to hide. Did you know this is the only de denomination in the world that can defend every single one of its doctrines on a public platform? There's no other denomination that can do this. And if you think, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to be nice and sweet tonight. <laughs> In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly then he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. This is my appeal to you. Even if people say that you are sectarian or that you are ridiculous, what is it that binds us together? It's the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's the testimony of Jesus is an integral part of this. So we must also say, if thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. I dare not face the world that is coming towards us at such a rapid pace. And tomorrow we're going to talk about these things. Where are we in the stream of time? How arrogant is the man who peeps out of his window and asks, where's Sisera? We are facing the iceberg. We are going towards the final events. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. Please note these verses. You know, people today, they want to preach only about the love of Jesus. Is there anything wrong with the love of Jesus? No. We should lift up the love of Jesus more than any other denomination in the world. We should. And if people would look, they would see that there are people amongst us, and I try to do it too, to lift up Jesus and to show that he's the only savior of the world and there is no other way. But it says here, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. Doesn't it say that? And over his image and over his mark. And over the number of his name, they stood on the sea of glass. Before we go to the antitypical Canaan in heaven, there's a war to be fought. 
We have to fight against the mindset of the beast. And the beast teaches that Jesus didn't die for you. And the image makes an alliance with the beast and propagates it even though the image is supposed to say he died for you. Does that make any sense whatsoever? And he's Mark. He says you don't have to worry about God's commandments. I've got a mark of my ecclesiastical power. You have a war to fight. And the number of his name. It's a satanic number. It's 666. The world's power. There's a war to fight. A victory to be gained. Then, once that war is over, you can't say no, bleed, bleed, I want to listen to the sheep and I don't want to get involved in this war. No. And then you'll sing the song of Moses. When was the song of Moses sung? After a praise ceremony? Or was it sung after a war? Exactly. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women, can you see all of these beautiful people coming out of all of these denominations, each one having contributed? But one is leading. There it was, Miriam. I wonder who's going to lead the end time one. I don't know. But I can guess. Sing ye to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider, that military power that was against us, has been thrown into the sea. Now is not the time to hold down our colors when they were scattered by persecution. This is from the Acts of the Apostles. They went forth filled with missionary zeal. They realized the responsibility of their mission. They knew that they held in their hands the bread of life for a famishing world. And they were constrained by the love of Christ to break this bread to all who were in need. This world is dying. We know the truth. There's no time for bleed, bleed. We have a message to bear. And it's not one person here and one person there that is to bear the message. Who's to bear the message? Every single one. This world is going to die. And Christ will have died for many, for nothing. Because we were playing bleed, bleed. God means that testing truth shall be brought to the front and become a subject of examination and discussion, even if it is through the contempt placed upon it. Don't be afraid of contempt. The minds of people must be agitated. Every controversy, every reproach, every slander will be God's means of provoking inquiry and awakening minds that otherwise would slumber. It doesn't matter if they call you a fool. It doesn't matter if they spit in your face. They did spit in mine, literally. Literally. Gave a lecture at a university, one of the biggest universities in my country. And the students were there and the geologists were there. They were so angry they, because they split into two groups and started fighting amongst themselves. Why? Because some said, there's a point to this. And the others hardened their hearts. And one of the geologists came forward and literally spat in my face. So what? If one or two or three or four or five of them made a decision for Christ, what's a bit of spit? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord. How are we going to be of one accord if we have so many factions in our church? Some of them calling this church Babylon, saying, come out of her. Oh, and Jesus is a created being. And the Holy Ghost is, is not, not a person. And they teach all kinds of things. And if you don't believe them, then you are Babylon. Catholicism teaches pantheism. A pantheistic God. I don't have a pantheistic God. I don't talk to a leaf. It's got nothing to say to me. It's got no mouth. 
and it cannot write and it cannot give me the word and if you get rid of the one then you get rid of Jesus and if you get rid of Jesus you get rid of your salvation because there's no other name under heaven and earth whereby you may be saved except Jesus isn't that so so don't listen to all of these strange factions that are trying to disrupt the sheep. What are they doing? Are they fighting against the beast? No. Are they fighting against its image? No. Are they fighting against its mark? No. Are they fighting against the number of his name? No. They're fighting you and telling you, you're stupid. Don't listen to them. That's not the war. So my brothers and sisters, I'm done. <laughs> That's what I want to say to you. I want to encourage you. We are in the closing days of this earth's history. You know, I've been preaching this for 32 years and every, every time we say the Lord's coming is close. But this time, I'm telling you, it's really close. All the prophetic scenarios are coming together as never before in human history. We are so close. Let's not listen to bleatings. Let's not listen to disrupting voices that want to tear this church apart. And let us even listen, let us not even listen to Meros, who's not interested in coming to the help of the Lord. We've got lots of Meroses. We've got lots of other portions of this church that don't want to be involved. It's too comfortable. Let's rather commit acts of kindness. Yes, nothing wrong with acts of kindness. Go ahead, do acts of kindness. But in the context of present truth. To lead people to God. And I've spoken enough, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have brought this movement together, which is called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Out of all those women that will be in your tent one day, that were prepared to die for these truths that we hold so dear today, and even if there are some who want to sell those beautiful truths for a pile of potash, Please raise up your people that they will grab those truths and put them in settings of gold and cherish them and not let them go and face the antitypical Sisera and his lies and get rid of that mindset out of our midst and follow where you have led and where you have left a trail of how you have led in the testimonies. Help us to accept them, to believe them, to walk according to them, and to accept every word of God as though spoken by you personally to each and every one of us. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.